Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the ASD podcast. Our guest today is Corinne Oman. Corinne, thank you so much for joining us. Corinne is a pilot, a mom, a parishioner, a faithful Catholic, and she's here today to speak about the topic of church closures, church restructuring, and all that that entails. This conversation um, has been developing for a while because Corinne, her family, or a good friend of um, me and my family, and I have been championing um, the restructuring of the Archdiocese of Halifax, Yarmouth, um, on the media, and Corinne has a differing viewpoint. And that viewpoint that Corinne represents really hasn't been getting much airtime. And so the conversation hasn't really been happening because the conversation has been um, exhausted by people like me who are fanboys um, for everything that's going on. And so we decided to, um, to, to develop the conversation by getting Corinne on and hearing an alternative perspective. While this is specific to the restructuring here in the, in the Archdiocese of Halifax, Jarna, um, and this is a restructuring for those of you who don't know, which is bringing um, the amount of parishes from 60 plus down to 20, um, and which does raise the specter of significant amounts of church closures um, over the coming years. And this is something which is in keeping with a move towards um, the theory is mission and evangelism within the Roman Catholic Church. And because of that, it's not limited to the Roman Catholic Church because there are um, similar issues taking place within Anglicanism and within the United Church. So while this conversation between Corinne and I um, will focus on the Archdiocese of Halifax, Jarmut specifically, it has the things we'll be discussing and the things Corinne um, will be speaking about, I think will have um, resonances for um, ending parish communities and church closures within um, the Anglican and the United Church um, Ecclesias. So let's begin with, Corinne, if you could speak a little bit about the, the disease, the discomfort, the, the issues that you have with what has been taking place um, and, and, and tell us a bit about that. Sure. Yeah, so I'm, uh, the, the restructuring that's going to be happening um, is moving forward. Um, it feels like it's moving forward at a rapid pace yes, uh, right. right now, especially. Um, and um, I think my main reason that I'm not comfortable with what's happening is that I don't exactly know why it's happening. Right. I think it's being framed um, for evangelism, yeah. um, it's being framed for lots of good things that I'm for. I'm, right. I'm for a lot of good things, and I'm for change, and I'm for um, moving things forward and attracting more people for sure. Um, but I don't uh, know that these are the real reasons that we're doing what we're doing. Okay. Um, and I guess because I don't really feel confident in our reasons, it makes me um, try and fill in those reasons myself and with the people that I'm talking okay. to. Okay, so I want to come to those reasons yeah. in a second because that's, I think, an interesting point. The, um, the official reading reasons, um, the reasons that are given are two which aren't, even I, someone who's tremendously in favour of this, they're not like, of course, reasons. So the reasons that I, I, I hear are one, um, the stockpiling of talent. So if you had um, two people in Parish A who were good at X and two people in Parish B and two people in Parish C, if you bring together, you will have a, a crack team of six. Mm -hmm. you know? And then the second thing is simply the, um, you know, yourself that is sort of, um, Quinn and I are both baseball fans. <laughs> and so if you have a ballpark that's sort of, you know, full, um, it's a different atmosphere and people might be more inclined to come along. Jump now, on the bandwagon. Jump on the bandwagon, yeah. yeah. Now these um, reasons, which are enough to convince a fanboy like me, aren't necessarily massively convincing. Mm -hmm. And so what does that lead to people talking about um, in the pews? What are you hearing? And so what are the alternative perspectives being given? Right, so the alternative perspectives, I think, are that it revolves around money. 
right. um, that there's not enough of it because there right. aren't enough people filling up the pews. Right. And um, it boils down to that. And so then that then raises more questions. Right. Um, it raises more questions like, well, <clears throat> where is the money? Um, where is the money going? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so you think there is that there's that there's not enough money, and so so the narrative is that let's say you've got three parishes becoming one parish, mm -hmm. um, the narrative is no one's saying the other two churches are going to be closed. Right. Um, but you are saying, and even I, as a massive supporter, would agree with this. Realistically, there's going to be a lot of churches closed and sold. Yeah. And 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 from your perspective, um, the organisers of this move. A, know that, yeah. and B, want that. Um, and that makes you sort of uncomfortable a little bit. Absolutely. Because of the lack of clarity, is it? The lack of clarity, the lack of um, transparency. Right. Yeah, that if, if we aren't saying this is a real problem, and you know, if it is a numbers problem, like a math yeah. problem, um, why can't we work together to solve the math problem? Right. Um, and be open about what the math problem is. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, what about the talent argument? Does that does that speak to you, or I, I, it it does and it doesn't because then when you are closing up those churches that people have massively invested in with their whole lives and their savings and and all of their time, you're you're bleeding off talent, and, right. and it's like you're saying, well, uh, you're not very important to us anymore. Right. Um, thanks a lot, but please go, right. and please go somewhere else. And we're going to tell you where to go. Right. And uh, people, um, the people that I'm talking to, um, nobody really likes to be manipulated. I mean, yeah. nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be told, okay, now you have to go here. Yeah. Um, we've decided that for you. Um, so you have people um, asking for pastoral care. Right. Um, and you have people asking to have prayer time together. And, and that's being denied. Um, so that you would have people who uh, love each other so much and um, have been there for each other their whole lives in a parish, um, not just a church, you know, yeah, the yeah, people yeah. of the parish who love each other, um, then they are, are being told to go out to other places. Yeah. And they're asking, they're saying, well, <clears throat> what if we, um, what if we meet over here? Can we meet us over here across the road at our um, parish hall? Because we just want to be together as a community. And we're all really important to each other. And we all show up for each other all the time. And um, then they're being denied that. Uh, tell me more about that. I don't understand that. So, <clears throat> so I guess specifically there's one church that's already been closed. Right. Um, and so they were given a reason as to why the church was closed. People haven't really bought into that particular reason. Right. Yeah. It, it, it felt very um, fabricated and, and so, convenient. And actually. so rather than move to the to the other church, they wanted to meet in the parish hall yeah. and they were told no. no. And they were told that by the parish priest, by the archdiocese, by... Uh, there was a transition of parish priest. Okay. So I think that, I could be wrong, but I think that they were told straight up by the Archdiocese that it was a hard no. Right. So th this is something that I, again, as a, as, as a massive supporter of this, do understand and appreciate. Um, that in every little church, be it Anglican, United Church, Roman Catholic, um, there's just a massive amount of memories and meaning mm. invested. And so even for people who aren't... Um, every Sunday, you know, their front pew. Right. Um, these are people who have been there, well, they don't remember this, at their baptism, at their communion, at their confirmation, when they got married, when they were burying loved ones. Yeah. And so the most important meaningful moments of their lives have been filled with this, with this place. Yeah. And so the loss of that place is a, is a significant emotional, spiritual and psychological blow. Yeah. Um, additionally, um, we have the issue in the church, again, not just the Roman Catholic Church, that things are established by the parishioners, the congregants. And so 
you know, you've got lots of immigrant churches that are built by the immigrants, that people have sold jewellery, they've sold, they've given their time, they've given their labour, they've given all these things to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be sold and the grandchildren of these people aren't going to see the money. It's mm -hmm. going to go into the, into the coffers of the organisation. So I very much get that, um, that issue. Um, but to me, that issue is an issue which needs to be handled with tremendous sensitivity, right. care, um, pastoral awareness. Right. Um, but you would say, A, that's not happening. No. And B, um, that that isn't sufficient it, it, because um, you think that that pain means that we should not close these churches. I think, I think what you need to do moving forward is to really ask people what they need. So if you right. go to some of these smaller parishes especially um, and you say to them, how can we help you? Yep. They know exactly the help that they need. Right. They will tell you. They, they know what the issues are. They, they can speak to that. And so if you are really um, interested in helping them, um, and you want to really listen to them, yep. you can make that happen with them and walk with them instead of uh, trying to force something on them that doesn't feel good at all. So the pastoral strategy seems the band-aid approach, which is just rip it off, yeah. make it happen, you've got 12 months to make this happen, yeah. um, do it. Do and, it and, and like it. And, and, right. yeah, and, uh, but it not, it's not being done in any kind of a caring way. It's, 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 it's just ripping it all apart and kind of scattering people to the wind, I find. Um, right. You know, again, with this same particular parish, they've asked, they, they have a deacon, uh, the deacon got moved to another parish, which is uh, also felt kind of very strategic. Right. Um, and then they said, uh, we, well, we want to have a Good Friday service, of course. And um, this deacon's been doing this Good Friday ser service since he became deacon. And uh, they were told no. Right. So, um, and also they're not allowed to have um, an Easter Sunday Mass. So, it, it, yeah, they're just supposed to go on to the next parish, I guess. And, um, yeah, it's just been very heavy-handed, um, yeah. very forceful. Um, yeah. So this is locks, something... Locks, locks, locks on the church changed. You know, wow. that kind of heavy-handedness, like, it... it it doesn't even feel real sometimes that it's happening this wow. way. So that's pretty spectacularly unchristian behavior. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is really important for, um, for me to hear, and I'm sure it's important for lots of people to hear, because what we have, so you've got a number of people, myself being one of them, who are passionately committed to um, reform, renovation, renewal, reinvigoration, all these terms, <laughs> and wants to implement a vision. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not just happening in the Roman Catholic Church. I see similar things happening in the Anglican Church, the United Church, and other, in all Christian churches. And there's a pro boy, is there a problem? Uh, uh, one potential problem with that, and if Corinne is correct, and there's no reason to think she's not. It's not just a potential problem, it's a real problem, is what happens to the people who are not on board or what happens to the people who who are not part of that vision and what's what it and so in a corporation what would happen is those people will be moved out, they would right. be disappeared like in the night of the long nights <laughs> in, in English Germany, and new people will be brought in who were committed to the message. Mm -hmm. um, now this is obviously not a Christian approach no. but it seems to be the case that when we do when we do finally get hooked on a vision and when we do get invigorated and passionate there is a body count mm. and that body count is caused by us not being Christian and therefore what are we doing it for yes. you know? yeah. uh, which seems like a sort of a, a, a significant problem so, I haven't been part of 
the the actual nuts and bolts of it. I mm. I, I I support it. I'm, I'm passionate about it. But I'm part of the nuts and bolts of it. But if someone who knew more than I were here, they might say, "But we did have consultations. We did want to make people heard." Um, and this um, vision is a vision which has come from the people. Right. What would you say to that? I would say no. It, it hasn't. It, it, there was an idea already in place when you were consulting. Right. And um, I know people who were consulted um, and they gave their opinions and then their opinions weren't heard. They just went and did the opposite thing. Right. So that's, that's not real consultation. Yeah. You're not really being honest with people um, and then ongoing where you know if you're saying that there's good communication um, there isn't there isn't right. good communication there's it's being sold so forcefully that right. uh, yeah I, I don't know I, I know of, I know of someone who was in a, a transition team meeting that's what they're calling it I think and um, you know, he wanted to go back to his parish to tell everybody what he learned in the meeting. I mean, yeah. we, we should be disseminating information. It should be open. It should be, everyone should know what's happening. And uh, he was told at the end of the meeting, don't tell anybody what's ha what we just discussed. Right. So, from my perspective, um, renewal and reform and renovation and all these things are about changing the culture of the church and one of the changes is from a, a clericalism to um, a more um, uh, inclusive understanding of leadership mm -hmm. and what you're saying is that in these transition teams um, many of whom feature lay leadership mm -hmm. um, there's a new kind of bureaucratic clericalism <laughs> where um, these people are are assuming the roles of princes of the church in that don't tell the kids yeah. um, we've got to manage and manipulate and move the kids into this position yeah. and if there's a couple of bad kids we'll send them off to a home for incorrigible youth yes. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, um, and we'll make this happen and that seems and that seems um, that seems quite problematic yeah. so at the very least if that is happening, um, maybe we need more centralized um, um, oversight in as much as possible to try and stop that happening. Mm -hmm. um, and we need um, greater attempts to establish a, a genuine communication, a real, um, to, like, like to, like to oversee the process. Um, there's so many other issues that I want to touch on um, while we have you. And one of them is the um, the issue of, of because you suggest that this is all about money. Um, I do think it is. Right. Yeah, that's what a lot of people do think, but that yeah. we're not saying that. Yeah, and I know that I know that some people have suggested, you know, again, this has got to be something to do with the with the sexual abuse crisis. Absolutely, and, yeah. Are we and, are and, we paying for other sins? Right now, and in the media at the time, a lot of people were suggesting that the that the model, where um, which was very triangular with mm -hmm. the archdiocese at the top and then right. all the various parishes, that now it's a kind of a the centralized archdiocese, but then these new parish units are going to be their own entities. Right. So, which means that if there if there is a um, issue of financial liability for sexual abuse or anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, that it wouldn't necessarily flow up to the top of the pyramid, but that it would be housed within this unit, right. which would be a sort of a, a safeguard against against other places being infected. Again, I would, if that is the case, I would suggest it's the case subconsciously, you know, because I can't imagine anyone would consciously go, this is the case, this is what we've got to do. And I know lots of voices in the media suggested that it was. Mm. Um, but these are the kind of issues that without not simply transparent communication, but coherent rationale, mm. you know? And one of the reasons I think that maybe we haven't um, been more persuasive is that, for, is that for some reason, the PR team um, have felt it best 
not to emphasize the success of St. Benedict as a model for this, mm. you know, um, because in my opinion, again, as someone who's outside St. Benedict, so I don't know, right. but in my opinion, that's a model for this kind of success. Okay. Um, and that shows what can be done. And if we were willing to say, look, the real reason for this is that we've seen tremendous things happening in St. Benedict, and we want your parishes to be like that, mm -hmm. I think, yes, that risks peeing off a lot of priests mm -hmm. who would go, no, I, we, no, that's not us. But at the same time, I think it would make the, the laity go, at least that's an argument. When it's right. when the argument speaks about, we're not really sure exactly why we're doing this, but it's about pooling talent somehow. This day, things that go, come on, there's something, you know, there's something, there's something up here. Yeah. And so I think that might be a sort of a uh, a public relations trick miss that in the efforts of of not putting parish priests' nose out of joint, um, <laughs> what we've done is. Um, create a climate where both media and parishioners right across the archdiocese are going there's something up here mm -hmm. we're, we're being we're being we're having the wool pulled over our eyes mm -hmm. um, which is an issue but the but if it is financial if there are financial implications um, that raises the question of what happens to church buildings mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on on the future of church buildings or how that gets handled or how that should be handled? Um, I listened to you on CBC and speak, speak right. to this and I heard some of the people who, who were speaking to it already and um, it just made me feel really sad <laughs> that, that you know you you could take a building like a church and just you know make it into a yoga, yoga retreat or something like or um, yeah. I mean these buildings are so much more than that and right. they mean so much more. Um, you know, I grew up in a family where when you drove by a church, you blessed yourself yeah. because it's God's house. Um, you know, when I take my kids to church, uh, you know, we're, we're there to visit with, with the Lord. Um, right. and, and he is present with us, when we, when right. we're, you know. Um, so these, it's, it just has so much uh, more meaning than just a building. And, and what do we do with the building? Um, I'm more interested in what do we do with the people? That we're leaving behind and, and why are we leaving them behind and thinking that that's okay they're they're all so important and they should they should be treated like they are important and that and that their opinions matter and so if you're bringing them into the conversation and you're asking them how can we help you not to make you into saint benedict's because that's maybe an off case actually it's in a growing community good for them i'm glad they're doing great um more power to them but how do we help you in your small community or your semi-urban community or your urban community do a great job of mission? Um, I really do feel like the people know, know the problems and the issues in their own parishes. And, and when you involve them in the process and really mean it, and, and you might not always get the answer you want to hear. Yeah. It might not look the way you want it to look. It might not look like St. Benedict's. That's okay. Let them be themselves and um, and tell them what the, the real issues are. Um, in the, some of those smaller communities too, you have people who are so skilled at fundraising. And they they put the roof on on the yeah. on these churches and they and then they put it on again. Okay, they they they've done all that work. Yeah. And so if you actually give them a number um, of what they need to do, they'll do it. If you say, okay, you need to fundraise this much. To have a priest um, say mass in your in your church, um, they will do it. They love their communities and they they want them to um, to still exist. Yeah, that I think it's a really interesting and live question. Um, my instincts are very much on the other side of that debate from where you are. Um, but I was speaking. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, um, in Antigonish, and I was speaking to a former colleague um, here from AST, um, who I think shares your your perspective. Um, and both her and you have made me second guess my my instincts on this. Um, so, 
where I was coming from at the start is you've got small congregations um, that are getting smaller on the whole. Sure. That's that's the trajectory. Um, that are in um, demographically problematic areas in the sense that you know the the areas are declining and so the churches are declining. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a sort of a a slight pall of misery, right? Now, what I mean by that is that the people who are involved, many of them, not all, have a sense of sadness about decline, about um, where the church used to be, where, where it is. They constantly tell stories about, you know, what it was like in the 70s when we had X amount of kids and, and things like this. And that narrative, that feeling um, is, is hard to book. You know, and I've seen churches again, uh, not necessarily Roman Catholic churches, but I've seen um, United and Anglican churches in rural areas, you know, which would have like twenty or thirty people on a, like on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, now the chances of that congregation bouncing back mm -hmm. um, seems to me to be to be small, and so the logic or the or the narrative is if we can fold these communities into one centralized dynamic energetic outward looking hub that we could and so if you have a, a, a an area where there's potentially 150 people coming to church mm -hmm. um, and there's 20 coming every every sunday if you fold those 20 into a centralized place that the dynamism, the energy, the, the, the opportunities for leadership that will emerge from that could maybe bring in 60 or 70 of those potential 120 into this new place. Um, now, that's one model. Right. Um, it's a model which, is, uh, which, which I am committed to. Um, Father James Mallon's um, divine renovation moving from a maintenance to a missional church, mm -hmm. I think you know, that's part of the, like, of the core rationale. And overall, I'm convinced by it. Um, but my colleague um, was talking, and, and, and what you've been speaking about, is that our call is to be, is to be Christian, to love one another, um, to model something different from the, the capitalist logic of the world, mm -hmm. which is about sales, which is about numbers, which right. is about all these things. Bigger's not always better. Exactly, yeah. bigger's not always better. And so how do we um, stay faithful to Christ's call to love one another and live differently, even if that costs numbers in the church even, mm. you know? Um, which is another, which is another, another lens. I guess I would argue too that I don't know that we've done enough to support those small churches. Like straight up, I don't think we have. Um, I don't know that they've always had um, the right people in place that have been joyful and giving amazing homilies and um, helping them grow, um, helping them reach out, you know, helping uh, those people who've been there uh, their whole lives reach out to their children, reach out to their grandchildren. I don't know that we've been giving them the right tools. Okay. I think I think we're kind of looking at them and saying, uh, you know, you. It's like it's like when you're it's like when you're in mass, and like and and then uh, the the priest is preaching to you, and and you're sitting there, and you made it there. You're you're there on that Sunday morning, and he says to you, um, oh, there aren't enough people here, and where is everybody? And and you're sitting there thinking, but I'm here, I, I oh, did there. I did it, hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got the kids out the door and my hair is sort of washed, yeah. here I am. Um, so yeah, it's that, that preaching, you know, getting mad at the choir for showing up kind right. of thing. And uh, yeah. So what you're saying is that if you had a Father James Mallard, who's a fantastic preacher, mm -hmm. in one of those extremely small congregations, yeah that congregation would grow. You don't Absolutely. need to have, um, you don't need to have demographic infrastructure. Um, but what happens is that the centralized leadership divvy up resources and <laughs> sort of establish the conditions for these places to, 
to the client. I think that's a, like, I think that's a, you know, a, 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 I think that's that more than like partly true. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I'd say, and again, this may not because this this begs the question of what of how mission relates to the call by Jesus Christ. Um, Juventus, uh, 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 I think I know, um, in Italy, based out of Turin, um, used to play in this um, wonderful, they're called the Old Lady, the most historic football club in Italy. Okay. And he used to play in this old stadium called uh, Stadio dell'Albi. And it was like 70,000 seater, you know, whatever. And they would be getting like a sort of 30,000 people week in, week out in the 70,000 people. And there was no one there, you know? And so they moved to a newer stadium with, I don't know, 50,000 max capacity. And since then, they've been routinely getting close to full capacity. Mm. And so they've added about 20,000 and the extra 20,000 have come because they were attracted to the atmosphere, the vibe, the, right. the, the fullness, yeah. you know? And so if you walk into a church with 20 people scattered out mm -hmm. this massive space mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the smell of decline everywhere, mm -hmm. you're going to be less likely to come back in. Whereas if you walk into a church that's bustling, mm -hmm. um, you're going to be much more, more likely. And right. so there are factors which would make the job Undoubtedly, Father James Mallon could do an amazing job in a, in, a, in a small parish, but there are factors which, which, which would make it easier for any priest to renovate when there is centralised talent to draw on. When you can say, I'm, you know, you, 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 you form your team to do this, you, 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 you form your team to do this. Mm -hmm. Again, I was in, uh, I, I preached a year and a half ago, um, a student of mine who was he was doing pulpit supply in the other church and um, asked me to come along and preach to this, mm -hmm. this congregation and it was, I said no problem, I thought she was in Cold Harbour or something, you know, drive three hours <laughs> in mm -hmm. Mo, and I went to this church and I, I'd say 19 people max, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I'm sure these are faithful people, these are good people, um, but if someone asked me 50 years time, is this community going to be here? Mm -hmm. I'm having a hard job saying, saying that that's the that that's the pragmatic move. Mm -hmm. you know? So is there a clash? Because you always struck me as a really pragmatic person. You're a pilot. Right. You're, yeah. you're a practical yeah, person. Is there a clash between um, between pragmatics and living um, the 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 spectacular heroic Christian life of martyrdom, where we love one another? irrespective of the cost. Is that a tension within all these debates within the various denominations? Um, uh, I, I get what you're saying about when you're talking about the stadium. So you were saying that they shrunk the stadium right? and, more people, and more people started to come. Yeah. But then they, so they shrunk the stadium, more people started to come. And then what did they have to do next? Are they going to have to build the stadium back up again and make it bigger? Well, I think well, they, 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 well I, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Uh, it's, so you it's, were not, doing it's not. It's right. not full. Like it's it's fifty thousand. Okay. 48, so they're the right amount. Okay. Right so they found they found their sweet spot. Well, potentially, maybe they will grow. Maybe they will. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, like we're gonna we're gonna shrink from sixty six to yeah. twenty. Yeah. Um, and, and then so hopefully then, we'll grow again. Then. So then we'll grow again, and hopefully, if this works, what if it doesn't? Um, then we could shrink further. Right. right? That's the worry too, is that we're just going on this path. Four. Yeah, four, yeah. <laughs> One big mass at the Metro Centre in Halifax. Right. That's it, that's what you get. Um, yeah, we'll carpool there. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, so, like, so then you, you shrink down and then you, to, to hopefully grow again, I guess, in, in generations. Um, but but the historical, like, the sort of, so, <clears throat> some would say, that the model of a church within a, a walking area catchment mm -hmm. area, yeah. whatever I meant to say there, um, that that is a kind of a, an early 19th, 20th century model, okay. you know? And now when everything is more motorized, everything is moving more urban, yeah. all the rest of it, um, that, it's inevitable that this is that this is what we do. That we expect people to drive 
in rural areas towards a more centralized area, yeah. whatever the environmental costs. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, burn, yeah, burn all that gas. Um, I, you know, I, I do understand what you're saying. Like, uh, like you know, when I go into let's let's use a corporate model too. Uh, I mean, when I go into a store yeah. and I'm shopping. Um, and then the store is buzzing. It's you know there's lots of people around, yeah. and I think to myself, wow, everybody must love this brand. Yeah. This is a great brand. I want to be part of this. Yes, this is, yes, this yes, is yes, awesome. Yes. Um, this is really fun. And then you go into another store, and you're the only one in there. Yeah. And you think, oh, well, I get. Why do I want to shop here? Yeah, this yeah. is maybe not so cool. Yeah. Um, but you know, is that what we're about then? Right. As, are we about oh, are we yes. about being the, the latest thing? Are we about being cool? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been a Catholic my whole life and I've never been cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I knew that from a very early age that, you know, you don't get to be both. <clears throat> you, you kind of, <laughs> you know, you, you can, you can kind yeah. of, you can kind of be one or the other yeah. and you try your best. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it just really, for me, comes back to uh, meeting people where they're at. Um, right. I don't uh, have the expectation that elderly people should have to drive long distances. I don't think that's very nice. Right. Um, I, I don't think that's how we want to treat our grandparents and, and treat uh, all these people who have built up our communities. Um, so yes, we have to shrink in certain ways. I'm not opposed to that. Like maybe, yeah, maybe we only get one priest for for four parishes, but I mean, it's it's happening even more than that. They're, they're saying like one priest to eight or something like that. Um, but yeah, that, you know, we can, those things can be made work, but to, to just close everything up and say, you know, we don't care about you anymore. Um, you're not in line with, with what, where we're going with this. Um, and, uh, that's just not cool. Like people, all those people really matter. Right. <clears throat> um, is, I guess my main point. Right. I think that's a good point. And I think that while um, I think that while I'm still not convinced by, while I'm still convicted of the positives of this, of this shift, um, I think that maybe a, this conversation is a good thing which needs to take place. Sure. And <clears throat> It needs and the, the perspectives that you're offering which are really good coherent perspectives need to be heard mm -hmm. um, and that if this transition or if any transition within other denominations is going to take place um, in a in a positive way I think we have to one be completely honest and transparent and real yeah <laughs> yeah know? um <laughs> We have to know what people are thinking and clearly say, here's why that's not the case, yeah. if it isn't the case. Or if it is the case, own it. Yeah. Because I think um, any sense that people are being um, um, herded like cattle um, into something that they're unaware of, um, can only bring disease, discontent, damage relationships, mm -hmm. and so weaken the very body that we're seeking to renew. Um, and so that I think is um, is is a, is is a, I think you're hundred percent right. One of the one of the challenges is that we've moved to the centralized model, to the decentralized model prior to decentralization. So again, we, we have a sort of a centralized pyramid model, and when we have these 20, 20, 20? 20. 20, 20, 20, like, like 20 parish units, um, they will be very much their own, kind of like almost mini diocese. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the year, the 12 month period of get this done, yeah. that already brings that into, it, 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 and, and so you've got new teams being formed, these transition teams, right. Um, who would expect it straight away to do the public relations right. within their spaces. Or, but um, not even, not even do the public relations, you know. <laughs> they're not doing this, but, yeah. but, but, but I think they're... But they're at the meetings and then, and then they're told at the end of the meeting to yeah. not share information. Yeah. That's completely cool. That's the point, yeah. And that's that's, that's yeah. not who we want to be. Like, yeah. I, think, I think we do absolutely want to be transparent. We yeah. want to have amazing communication. And it's a two-way street. People aren't... People aren't against you. People aren't uh, against 
um, any change at all. People right. people want to see their their um, their pews busy and full. Right. They they. And and I don't know I, when you used the word sad before I didn't really like that like I, I don't when I when I go to um, a more rural church I don't feel a sense of sadness I guess I feel welcome back home right um, and I feel that uh, there's just a lot of love there right. yeah and and so yeah like we do we we do need to change uh, we we definitely need to. Um, be reaching out to our young people in a, in a new way um, and making them feel that uh, this is theirs. This is, and, and where are they at? And let's meet them where they're at. I just, I just, that's my main thing. It's like, what, what do people want and need? And let's try and minister to that. Um, uh, make the young people when they're getting uh, their sacrament of confirmation feel super important because it is a big major day yeah. have the bishop show up to your confirmation please right. yeah let's have that happen and let's 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 really uh recognize but that how probably can happen now when we're in the 20s like yeah plus. yeah um, yeah maybe yeah. i don't know <laughs> yeah. I, it should have always been happening i think right. it should have always been happening we i don't know that we're um we have to look at our young people like we have to remember what it was like when we were young, right. and we have to um, be reaching out to them in a real way that is um, totally meeting them where they're at. They're they're having to navigate so much more than we ever did. Um, they have so much more pressure on right. them, um, and it's it's probably even harder for them moving forward uh, as being so different than what's going on in society. I'm with you, but I think that, again, I think that's a, a reason for the change, because if you're a young person in a very, very small parish, um, you're definitely condemned to that outsider status that you've yeah. sort of identified, yeah. whereas within a, a buzzing, vibrant community, you could theoretically have lots of foolish kids <laughs> um, you know well like, like, like within that thing see where I like where I ag agree with you um, and I was kind of trying to sort of wind it up with, with <laughs> agreement where I agree with you is that I think that that, that if we don't um, get transparent get really communicative um, between now and December 31st mm -hmm. and I think the the Archdiocese probably should encourage the transition teams to work an awful lot harder on that. If we don't do that, then we're going to make more and more problems. And as things ramp up towards December, things are going to be in a mess. Yeah. Right? So, so I'm with you 100% in the communications part. But I also am um, where I'm a little bit, where, where there's two different models of the church happening. And your model, I think, is, is in many ways... The better model because it because again it focuses on the people of god it focuses on the people and this is what we have in the Lumen Gentium. this is what we have coming out of the second vatican council um i'm not a mass i don't trust people okay. <laughs> you know? um, and you know henry ford famously said that you know if he asked people what they wanted they would have told him faster buggies you know okay. Um, Apple have gotten to where they are today by not by you know telling asking people what they want and trying to put that into practice, but by having a clear vision and implementing that. Now right. whether that's and so and I don't that, like Apple. Well, I don't like Apple either. <laughs> I don't like Apple either. You know, but I'm but, an Android user. But yeah. <laughs> I'm from an Android family. <laughs> <I'm not committed. laughs> My husband hates Apple. He he hates. He hates when he looks at a screen and he's like, I have to leave it that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm with so, them. I mean, so then, uh, like, I mean, I'm, that I'm just gets you. back to, like, being told what to do. Yeah. Right? We don't like being told what to do. My husband doesn't like opening up a phone and being told that he has to have his app right yeah. there. I don't like being told. My family doesn't like being told. You go to Mass over here now. I think that consciously we don't. But I think unconsciously we might. Yeah. Because, one, the success of Apple. And, two... What was the difference between, ultimately, early Facebook and MySpace? Why did Facebook kill MySpace? 
you're probably too young to remember MySpace. No, but MySpace no, 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 no. was just, people could do whatever they wanted. Yeah. And when you clicked on the MySpace page, it was the ugliest, flashing things here, bouncing things there. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and Facebook says, you don't get to choose. These are the colors. These are the spaces. Yeah. And even the though maybe... kind of dead now too, though. No, for sure. But yeah. even though mentally you might have thought, no, I don't want the freedom to do whatever I want to do, maybe we didn't bring it. And so, and so I think that if you, like democracy would be horrific in my opinion. Right, but it's a, it's a, we're into like a, a parental kind yeah. of thing. Like I know better than you, you, yeah. you go do this. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want that anymore for myself. I'm right. too old for that now. Right. Um, I, I am, I am old <laughs> and I don't want to be told what to do. Nobody does. Nobody really does. Um, I, I just feel like so much more outreach could still happen, didn't yeah. happen, and now we're in this spot. Um, and, and, I, and look, I, I get that we want to change. Yeah. I, I, I really do get that. But um, you just have to meet the people where they're at. And you, and you, have, to, you have to help them do a good job. And, yeah. and, and it's not by dictating to them where they go to Mass. It's right. not by uh, dictating to them which building to use and which building not to use. Let they know. They know where they want to meet up. Yeah. Um, they and they love each other and they want to be together. And it's not that they're in love with their building. They they are. Uh, they love each other and they see they see Jesus in each other. Right. And that's 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 amazing and that's what we want and we want that moving forward. Okay, I think I think you win that argument, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I, I think the people will see that you win that argument. Um, what I would say, however, is that, and I only half believe this to be the case, but I'm going to say it anyway because I want to try and win this next point, um, <laughs> which is that you've suggested that it is the um, the powers that be um, mm -hmm. in the past very clerical, now the new sure. bureaucratic lay leader, which is a similar kind of thing, yeah. just, it's just a new form of clericalism, um, but that they are superimposing the centralized vision on the people, mm -hmm. right? and oh, the people absolutely. don't necessarily want it, right? Yeah. Now, where I would look to counter, and I'm not necessarily sure that I even believe what I'm saying myself now, um, is that the vision that the um, that leadership in the church are committed to is not their vision it's the vision of Jesus Christ who told them to go forth and proclaim the gospel um, who told them to heal the sick and committed to this vision um, they are looking to establish the church on a more coherently missional footing and mm -hmm. um, that that requires these changes mm -hmm. um, and if the people disagree it's not necessarily that the people disagree with leadership they maybe are, are less committed to the evangelical vision of Jesus Christ um, than, than the leadership are and while I know that you're committed to it there are lots when I was when I was your age when I was um, probably the same age, yeah. <laughs> we're pretty sure. But I, I, when I was when, when I was in college, evangelism was a filthy word. It wasn't just a dirty word; it was a right. filthy word. Um, it was basically a, a bad thing. The idea, even for Pope Francis in Morocco last week, you know, he was talking about the, the you know the perils of proselytization and you know you, you know you can't be doing this, um, and so there's a sort of a, a negativity. To Christians looking to um, bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ mm. and there are many people who are iffy about more missional movements within the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church who perhaps share either culturally or ideologically a real disease with making disciples they don't necessarily believe in making disciples. They believe the church is designed to meet people where they're at, which is to care for them wherever they are, which is kind of a more pastoral model, dare I say it, a more maintenance model <laughs> rather than a more missional model, you know? So again, what would you say to someone saying, this is all because you're against Jesus? 
<laughs> that's oh gosh, a, that's I, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But you don't. But, but 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 are there not a lot of people who are? I don't think we a certain generation who are who don't like, who don't feel who are who are less convicted by the need to make disciples and to spread people to encourage people towards relationship with Jesus Christ. Some people are not that animated by that. I can only speak to my own life and my own experience, and um, it, we, we don't want to be evangelized to, like I remember somebody coming up to me once on the bus and, and saying like, um, have you accepted the Lord Jesus as your savior? And I just looked at him and I said, yes, I have. And because he, he was kind of disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I had a whole yeah. like book to yeah. show you. And, and I was like, you know, nobody likes that. Yeah. Okay, we don't, yeah. we don't want to yeah. be, yeah. we don't want to be that. Yeah. But um, what's wrong with sending out an email, picking up the phone, reaching out to somebody who might be on the edge, um, who might have that history of, of being baptized, but that right. has shown up since. Um, what is wrong with reaching out to them and saying, um, we miss you, uh, how can we help you, first of all, let's try to help people, and, and once we start helping people, um, how can, you know, how can, so we're, we're approaching them in service, and, and how can we uh, be all be in relationship together, as, as our community together? Um, so, I mean, someone reached out to me and said, um, because I wasn't going to do it if someone didn't reach out to me. Someone reached out to me and said, do you want to teach level one catechism? And I said, oh. <laughs> and, and I thought about it and I, and I you know, prayed about it. And, and I thought, I can do that. I have the skill set to do that. Right. I have that in me. I think I have just enough time where I can make that work. And that's worked out to be an amazing thing for me where I've gotten to share gifts grow as a Catholic, grow as a Christian, um, and it, it came about because someone reached out to me. Okay, now there is a prayer that we don't pray in our church, um, <laughs> but they pray in many churches the, uh, for the restructuring, Right. Um, and if you go to the facility you'll, you'll hear prayers and so on and so forth, yeah. and it talks about communities of communities. And so within a within the kind of parishes that we want to become, it is a community of communities. And these communities are equipped for exactly the kind of outreach that you're that, you know that you're talking about. That they can sort of that they're animated by this mission and they can reach out and they have the you know the collective talent to, to see needs for this and to bring people in and all this kind of stuff. In the church that I preached in last year with 15 people. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the chances of exactly the kind of stuff that you're talking about taking place, in my opinion, are are less likely to happen within that wee space um, than within a parish like St. Benedict, which can work with the community of communities model and have kind of pods <laughs> you know, of people who are animated to reach out. So, now again, it can get too much. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you. I understand that a sort of a, an ecclesial Amway culture is going, to, is going to alienate some people, I understand that. Mm. Um, but evangelism and outreach and invitation seems to require the kind of um, density of talent and leadership um, that is more likely within um, big I don't want to use the word vibrant because I, I understand exactly what you're saying about the problem with the word sad, but bigger churches, mm -hmm. like, the, like, the, like the smaller churches, mm -hmm. but, but what, what you're saying is that a small church, um, yes, it might not be able to bring in 50 people to bingo or to the gym or, or, or to whatever, mm -hmm. but one person could reach out to one other person and make a difference in their life, yeah. and that that's just as valid, although numerically this this you know like is proportionate. Right, um, and I was in another meeting recently too, where there was a smaller church um, in attendance to our catechetical meeting, and uh, what was interesting is that we are a bigger church than the church that you and I are part of, 
Um, and this smaller church uh, had two people there at this, at this meeting. There were more of us than there were of them. And, but what, what was interesting is when they were talking about uh, their catechetical program, we were um, finding it hard to involve the community yep. and we we're finding it hard to involve parents and yeah. get them, get them um, into our program and um, volunteering in our program, I should say. And they had no problem with that. They knew right. all their people. Yeah. So, the, so I mean, yeah. that bigger, better model, I don't know that that's true. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't even know how we're going to measure this. Right. You know, it, yeah, are we measuring this by money? Like, how are we, what is, yeah. how are we measuring what we're going to change? So, right. yeah. The one thing for sure is that if we are changing, we need everybody on board and so much as we can get everybody on board. Yeah. And the only way to get people on board is by having open and transparent conversations. Yeah. Um, and you've done a brilliant job in articulating a whole host of perspectives and lenses which um, are in which are frequently heard in personal conversation, right. almost never heard in the collective conversation that, that are taking place. And it needs to be heard because that's the only way the conversation can like, like can take place about this. So Corinne, thank you so much for this. This is um I think this has been you know, you haven't convinced me but you've really give me an awful lot to chew on um, and, 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 and move me and um, I know that there are um, similar conversations within other church bodies um, and I think the perspectives that you've been offering definitely in relation to communication, transparency, honesty, integrity, uh, a genuine conversation on what we're called to, what the nature of mission looks like. Um, these are conversations that we have to have um, if we're to avoid um, the kind of uh, the kind of dictatorial model that is sort of in the deepest, darkest recesses of my mind, I'm actually okay with. <laughs> and so, I'm not. And, uh, I'm, I'm rightly so. I'm rightly so. Um, Corinne, thank you so much. I Thanks. appreciate it. And thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, um, or for listening. Um, um, if you're watching on YouTube, down below, I'll um, post a link to the conversation about, um, on CBC about church buildings and things like that. And uh, I'll post some other links as well, for maybe for you to get involved in this kind of conversation. Um, because these are conversations that have to be had and have to be had publicly as we move towards um, the new year and the radical restructuring. Yeah, communication is good. Communication is good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Corinne. Thank you.